Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody. Can you hear me? Um, yes, hi. I would like to welcome everybody to this brown bag event. Uh, great to see you all here. Some familiar face, faces and a nice full crowd. Uh, my name is Linda Vanigan. I'm chair of the history department. And my role here this morning or at noon here is to introduce our speaker. So um, we have had, we've had this brown bag lecture series for uh, quite a while now, and it wouldn't happen without the Kearney Public Library. So we've been working in collaboration with the library for, for some time, and we have a special thank you to the Kearney Public Library for collaborating with us. <laughs> Some more uh, talks scheduled. Um, they, they're basically once a month on the second Wednesday of each month. And um, this is the web page to our history department web page that will list the, um, the list the events. And I think we have. Um, I think that's yeah. We don't have a list of, of who's coming up next. We got three slides. Yeah. Slide, slide oh, okay. <laughs> oh yeah, there it is. So coming up December 14th, Caitlin Setzler. She's actually one of our graduate students, and this is the work that she, her research she's been working on, comparative nationalism. In January, January 11th, we have Brock Anderson over here, um, and he'll be uh, talking about Carney's 100, 150th anniversary year. So that's what we have scheduled coming up. Put it on your calendar. We'll have more going forward well into the summer as well. Um, the special event for today is going to be with one of my colleagues in the history department, Dr. Nathan Tai. Um, and before I introduce him, I just want to give him special credit as well for organizing these brown bags. He's the key organizer, instigator, um, initiator, uh, <laughs> making all this happen. So if we can give him a round of applause for being the director. Of the Um, he is assistant professor of history um, in our department. His special focus is uh, Nebraska and American West history. Uh, he's taught uh, with us since 2019. Uh, he received his PhD from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, Illinois. And his research focus, his larger research focus in the book that he's working on, focuses on migrant laborers, better known as hobos, and um, he, spoke, he focuses on the, on the um, not necessarily the economic and legal side of this, but the cultural history of migrant workers, uh, also known as hobos when you're looking in the 1910s, 1920s. Um, his, he's deeply interested in local and community history, as we can see today. Um, and again, when he does local and community history, he's not looking necessarily at uh, economics um, or law, but at the culture. And um, so his focus and his interest is on the marginalized, overlooked, or little-known histories. Um, today is one of those little-known histories. Where's the title of our talk? <laughs> the Kearney Street Railroad Railway. So please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Tai as our speaker. Oh, well, talk's canceled. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. <laughs> 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 
Boom. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you all for, for coming. Um, I'm excited to um, talk to you about something that I think all of you probably have some sense about. You know, maybe you've seen Carl or Rosie um, around town, our, our current trolleys, or, or almost certainly you've seen some of the photos that we're going to be talking about today. This is also kind of one of the, the older stories about Carney that is, is told frequently, um, but, but very succinctly. Um, nobody's really dug deeply into the full kind of history of the Kearney Street Railway. Um, this is also um, an example of how history always isn't just a, a linear uh, progress narrative. Um, this is a history of publicly subsidized transportation powered by green energy. Uh, the city of Kearney provided part of the funding for this and it was, it was powered by hydroelectric, um, a hydroelectric power plant. So things that you know are in conversation today about green energy, about public subsidies for public transportation, if you've been following you know, the kind of ongoing debate about light rail in Omaha, these things are very much topical and shows that over a century ago, Carney was at the forefront of these conversations. Okay. So, you know, we got to go all the way back to the very beginning. This is Carney 149 years ago. Okay, or 100, yeah, this is 1873. So, very beginning. We don't look that big, do we? <laughs> no, not a lot going on, not a lot of population, a couple of farmsteads, fairly flat, but with significant um, elevation as you get further north into the Platte Valley, right? For anybody who's, who's tried to walk up Second Avenue, um, <laughs> they know that that incline is very much still there. But the community is growing. Three, within three years, the community has expanded. We have a rail link with the Burlington and Missouri Railroad, um, which now uh, no longer is this, this little rail link runs into Anderson Wrecking and then stops, um, but used to go into uh, Hastings and connect with uh, what becomes the Chicago Burlington and Quincy. Uh, we have the Union Pacific. We have um, a line that will eventually go all the way, um, the, the Black Hills Railway, which will go to Callaway, and a growing downtown. Okay? And we begin to see urban spread into kind of western parts of the city and then further eastern parts of the city. And again, we have significant elevation here up north. The city on the main in 1876. Okay? City of possibility. A couple years later, uh, this is um, 1881. We now have a school. This is the old, or this is the original schoolhouse here in Carnegie. This is the Whittier School, um, which some of you might remember. Um, those who attended Longfellow, it was eventually turned into the Industrial Arts Building um, that was in the middle of, of the Blacktop, Blacktop Playground um, at Central Elementary. This is now the parking lot of the Marion, Marion um, Presbyterian Church. And then um, again, significant growth around the downtown quarter here along Central Avenue. Okay. And then, um, as, as every town is want, we, we, we do have a, a, a horse racing track <laughs> in the current Pioneer neighborhood. Growing, but you know, and moving about town is, is fairly difficult. These, these bird's eye photos um, are. are very uh, idealized depictions of the community, okay? You don't see the loose dogs, you don't smell the horse manure, you don't see the muddy roads on a rainy day. This is what Kearney looks like in 1885. This is downtown Kearney in 1885, okay? So uh, that is being organized for, um, I believe, 4th of July or, or maybe Decoration Day, uh, what becomes Memorial Day. Loose dogs in town, and then open sewers along the sidewalk. Okay, which you can imagine what that is full of um, in this era. And then incredibly muddy um, roads and, you know, developed. We have, as you can see here, there's a fire hydrant. Hey, we've got water. Um, but still very, very rudimentary. And there's a number of um, accounts from these early residents. There's, there's an early resident who, who gave a recollection in the 1930s. It says dusty roads in a dry spell and deep ruts after a wet spell. Those are the roads of Kearney. Mm -hmm. It was really difficult to get around for a lot of folks in this early time period. Um, as you can see, everybody's got a horse and buggy to get around town. Okay. So there needs to be a change. And there's an early organized effort by members of the local community, a number of local bankers, a number of local attorneys, 
in the community to um, develop a, a different type of transportation in the community. And this type of transportation is going to revolutionize the way in which uh, men and women travel around Kearney in this period. And that is the horse to run trolley. <laughs> we're not to electricity yet. We're, we're, we're going to get there. But we're still with the horse. Um, so in 1885, a number of these early kind of notable capitalists within the Kearney community, E.C. Coggins, who's, who's a local attorney, most notably among them, um, organized enough capital to have a very small um, horse-drawn uh, car system developed in town. And we're going to look at a map at, at, at where this goes. But this is this is downtown Kearney, 1886, 1887, directly from the railroad tracks. As you can see, here's the low building, which still stands today. There is no opera house yet, which will be right over here. And then all the way, you can kind of begin to see the hill starting to go up, up Central Avenue, and then the Midway Hotel will eventually be back here at the crossing of 25th Street. But downtown, you know, looks a lot busier than it looks today. The streets look a little bit wider. The, the uh, carriages are a little bit smaller than, you know, a pickup truck. But you're beginning to also see in an image like this, not only the, the modernity that this form of transportation is bringing, but there's also electricity. You're starting to see the modernizing influence come to Kearney. The residents are demanding these new technologies to improve their daily lives. They're not powering the road yet, or the, the streetcar line yet, but we've got early and very, admittedly, very weak electricity um, in this time period. Um, and this is where the trolley route originally runs. Okay, so this is a map of Kearney um, from the 1880s that depicts the terminal, the southern terminal. This is the courthouse, which is located where the present day courthouse is. So this is the southern terminus. And the streetcar line goes all the way up Central Avenue until it gets to 25th Street. And then it splits and it goes east into um, the East Lawn neighborhood and actually um, terminates where the county fairgrounds are today. Okay. And it goes as far west as what at the time was known as Green Terrace, um, which becomes the first dormitory at the normal school, but in this time period is, is used as a hotel. So it goes. Um, down 25th Street, then up 2nd Avenue, and then across 26th Street to Green Terrace, which is located presently where Antelope Hall is on campus. So if any of you have been on campus recently, it just it just stops just short of the fountain. Okay, is where, where the trolley line would be. But this image also depicts, you know, we've had significant expansion in the 1880s. And one of the things that that is true about streetcar technology in this period is that there's no form of transportation that is more readily and swiftly adopted in United States history than the streetcar. You would think it's the automobile, but it's not. The automobile actually, it, it took a while because the internal combustion engine and early automobiles have already been invented by this time period, but the roads are awful, so nobody buys an automobile, okay? This is much easier for people to use. You can go down to town in a horse-drawn cart you don't have to worry about your own horse. You don't have to worry about your own wagon. And you can go whenever you want. Okay? It's a much more efficient form of travel for early residents of the community. And you can see in these early photos, and we're going to look at some of the, you know, these are photos that you have almost certainly seen of the community, right? But unless you're really looking closely, you don't necessarily see the trolley tracks, the rundown. This is the Midway Hotel. The, the very famous and very short-lived um, hotel at the present uh, location of Apple Mart that uh, burned down um, and was, was eventually replaced by the second Midway Hotel. But this path here is actually the roadway for the horse carriage. You can see the trolley tracks on either way. It kind of curves, and then off in the distance, it also curves. And this is Central Avenue, where the line will go. And again, this is then this is 25th Street. Um, Again, it's a significant improvement, okay, in the infrastructure over the years. Although this is this is truly an incredible building, um, and as you will see in most photos of this era, just loose dogs, just kind of hanging out um, in most of the photos. But again, we've got electricity, we've got large hotels, we're beginning to draw people, 
Okay, we're beginning to draw interest. We're beginning to draw eastern capital. Again, here's a here's a, a slightly closer look. Again, the road road bed you can see it curve. So, <laughs> with with the horse line, you can't actually go from West Kearney to East Kearney. You have to go all the way down to Courthouse and back. You have to go in the Y route because this isn't connected. Which kind of makes the journey a little long. Um, but they want to get the most out of all of their all of their riders. Yeah. Again, streetcar line right here. But again, this gives you a sense of what the roads look like. This is dirt and manure. Okay, the roads are awful. And this is something that is frequently com commented upon um, in the press and in memories of this time period is absolutely utterly how awful the roads are. And as a result, the streetcars don't always run. Um, if if there's been a if there's been a big rainstorm, which we are want to have, um, if there's been a freeze, if there's been any sort of weather events, um, the streetcar will not run. Okay, um, which makes things very difficult again for us. And this is this is approximately uh, this is just west of Apple Market today. This is this is a, a ice cold storage uh, building. And you can see that again on one of these days where the, the, the roads are particularly muddy and streetcar lines here. And this is looking on Central Avenue South. Here is the Opera House, the old First National Bank, which is now law offices and also missing the top story of the building. They, they clipped it off. And you can see in the distance, again, these, these are incredible photos which we'll talk about, but you can see in the distance, there's the horse and the trolley. But again, the roads are awful. Again, streetcar lines right here, very faintly. Okay. Here's you know the, the, the former location true cafe, right? Which then will be doubled eventually with expansion. And then the opera house, just very faintly, right here. Or the low building, again, right here on the corner of the railroad. Here are the tracks. But the streetcar line is, is, is formed in 1886, and they lose money every year. We don't have enough ridership for to maintain a line. Um, oftentimes, folks get frustrated. The train isn't coming on time, or the, the trolley's not coming on time. Um, maybe it's not running that day. Maybe the horses are ill. Um, you know, you can just go into the stable, get your own horse, and go downtown, or you can just walk. Okay. Um, so they operated a loss every single year, and actually, their last year. Um, they operated a loss of $172. <laughs> and you can get a sense of, again, one of the chief complaints is that the infrastructure is so bad that the, lay, the rails are just, just laid in the mud. Okay, And this is, there's in, in the late 1880s, 1888, we host a National Grand Army of the Republic encampment. Um, and U.S. military units come, Civil War veterans come. Um, they set up stands for thousands around Lake Kearney, and they reenact the Merrimack and the Monitor with um, little rowboats that they've made up like ironclads. Um, and this is the parade that, that goes along with that event. And you have to look closely, but the tracks are there. But again, showing how muddy the conditions are, how bad the infrastructure is, this is there's actually a Y here um, where the lines go through. Um, and so with the failure of the horse-drawn street railway, but a growing city in steps in kind of one of the um, longtime figures in the development of Kearney in this period. And, and we're now at 18, we're in the mid 1880s. Okay, and this is this is Kearney in the 1880s. This is actually taken from um, Lake Kearney, looking south. Okay, and, and you can see that the community has expanded significantly. Here is the Midway Hotel from behind. Here's Whittier School, now the Merriman and Central Elementary. Grain elevator down by the railroad tracks. Okay. Significant expansion. We have we have come a long way since the, the 1873 um, image. This is only 15 years. Slightly, we go just a, a, a year further. This is 1889. Again, you can see the Midway Hotel, Whittier School. Kenwood, actually all the way down here in the distance. And then uh, the courthouse, very, very faintly. 
And this is when George Washington Frank steps in. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with this with this name. This is George Washington Frank. He's the namesake for the GW Frank Museum of History and Culture located on campus, on West Campus. He's the one who built the over-the-top stone mansion, the stone house on the plains. Um, and he's a uh, capitalist from back east. He's actually from Warsaw, Wyoming, which is a small community outside Buffalo. Um, his father was a doctor and a merchant. His brother was a congressman who was instrumental in the passage of the 13th Amendment, which ended enslavement. And his father also uh, ran an underground railroad station in Warsaw. And so comes from a very, very prominent family in that community. There's actually a Frank house in Warsaw uh, from the 1830s from, from the Frank family that is still there. Um, and he initially goes to Corning, Iowa, small community in central Iowa. He builds a very large mansion there, a, a large pond that he, he stocks with koi and other, other exotic fish for the 1870s. Um, and he's eventually lured here by his cousin, uh, Colonel Patterson, who is an early uh, railroad developer here in central Nebraska. And he says, you know, Kearney is a city on the make. You, sh you should come out here. Um, there is a lot of possibility. We have a growing population. We have um, a good, we think, base for industrialization. And oh, by the way, we have like a, a streetcar line um, powered by horses. And George Washington Frank says, okay, I'm, I'm sold. And so he comes to the Kearney community. He builds his home. He begins to invest in a lot of businesses. And a lot of the early industrial um, structures that we think of with the history of Kearney are funded with Frank money or Frank support. So the cotton mill, the namesake of Cotton Mill Park, um, is, was an actual cotton mill on the west side of town funded with Frank money. Um, he had a brickyard. He had a stoneworks. He had... Um, a lot of industrial um, folks come and look at Kearney and say, this is a really great place to build a business. You're, you're centrally located, you're on a rail line, um, and you have a somewhat ready supply of labor. Okay. But to, to draw people, he would have, um, and this is an image of, he would, he would have shipments of possible investors come to Kearney to look at the lay of the land, look at the city, meet the people, and see its possibilities. And so um, this is one of those trains, and you can actually see they, they put a little badge, Carney, Nebraska, <laughs> on the side of the train. And you can see that they're, they're fairly well off. They're fairly well-dressed individuals who are coming to the city. And one of the things that he does to both bring this capital here to, to really show that Kearney is a modern, forward-thinking community is electricity. It's water power and it's electricity. And what goes along with that then is the electrification of the streetcar line. So much so that in 1889, when all of these things are starting to come together, when, when um, George Washington Frank has brought in Eastern Capital, he has built his large home, he has attracted industries. This is the assessment of the year that is put into the Kearney Hub. The cotton mill, the sewage system, free postal delivery, a new public library, which is true, the public library has been founded in 1890. Um, the Wood River Railroad, the electric street railroad, the Carney baseball team, which we were a baseball powerhouse back in the day, uh, the new freight division in the city, the Missouri Pacific extension from Prosser to Carney, which does not come, um, and then in the soup, the fly, Phoebe June, that new opera house, the merchant that don't advertise. So the things that are in the swim, all of this new development, the things that are in the soup are, you know, well, we do get a new opera house, and I get obviously. If you don't advertise in the hub, nobody's going to see it. <laughs> and so these are the possibilities that he brings. Okay. And for many at the time, this is there's there's a saying, there's a, it's, a, it's a tagline in a lot of the early advertisements, and this is what, what Frank really promotes, is that we're going to be the next Minneapolis. Not the next St. Paul, next Minneapolis. <laughs> Minneapolis on the plains. Okay. But there's growing concern in the community about what George Frank is doing. Um, and so there's a war of words in the hub of when he has his engineers come out and they look at the old horse line and they're like, this is inadequate for a modern electrical street railway. Um, and so the engineers are out and they, they, they get chastised um, repeatedly by different people, you know, as you want to in a small town, 
you're a construction worker, you got a cert, you got your 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 surveying equipment, you're out on, on Central Avenue, and somebody just comes up and talks to you and actually tells you where the streetcar line should go. Right? They're like, oh no, no, it should go on the side of the street, no, it should go in the middle of the street, no, it should go on the side of the street. Um, and they're dealing with this. And so the hub kind of talks about the lively squabble about where we're gonna put the streetcar line, and he responds with a three-page letter to the Carney Hub. Um, criticizing them for, you know, talking about these baseless rumors, um, chastising his efforts, you know, that until we actually have built something so that the people can at least imagine for themselves what we're doing, it is not just to throw obstacles in the way of progress. Okay, don't complain until I've actually put streetcar lines down. Okay, we haven't done anything yet. The surveyors are just out looking for what we do. Um, throw off nor prevent the consummation of what every good citizen of Kearney must heartily desire the building of an electric railway line in Kearney. And he goes on to outline in his response to kind of the local naysayers that if you want to build it, you find the capital. <laughs> and of course, nobody can. Um, so you kind of got to go with, with George Washington Frank. And what the city ultimately does too is they pass um, a series of bonds, and, and, and we, the city of Kearney pays $50,000, um, which is um, roughly like a million and a half um, to help fund the development of the electric railway in Kearney. Again, so publicly subsidized public transportation. Now, to deviate a little bit, because this is what historians do, we like to deviate. All of the photos that we're seeing today almost exclusively come from the GW Frank Museum um, of History and Culture on campus. And one of the real treasures of the history of Kearney are these photos. You've almost certainly seen these photos reprinted. Maybe you've got a copy of the Hubs Like It Was, or you've got the book from 1998 from the 125th anniversary, or you've seen these in other presentations um, or, or pictured other places. But this is a photo album that was put together in part for the street railway. Um, so A.T. Anderson, who was an early photographer here in Kearney at the turn of the century, um, a Swedish immigrant, was just starting out in the photography trade um, in a little, little studio in Old Town, just south of the railroad tracks on Central Avenue. And he tells this story in his memoir in 1945. He was in his studio, again, really young, had taken over a studio from, from um, another Swedish photographer who wanted to become a sheep farmer south of town, and he did. Um, and Augustus Frank, the son of George Washington Frank, just pulls up outside and shouts at him with a contract saying, I drove up to the little South Side Studio, stopped in the street and called me out um, and made an offer that I need you to shoot eight by 10 photos of the residences of the community, the industries of the community, the streets of the community. Um, and it's this effort, he, they were shooting promotional images okay, of the community. And, and A.T. Anderson was so new at this, he didn't have a camera that could shoot eight by 10 photos. So he had to frantically write to a photography studio in Omaha they could loan him a multi-hundred dollar apparatus to actually shoot these photos. Okay? And the fact that they even survived this photo album of these early promotional photos, which documents then the street railway, because these are the images that are then shown to the Eastern capitalists. These are the images that are then sent East to investors to look at the city of Kearney. Okay? So even the archive that this um, presentation is coming from is a product of the street railway okay, and these images which again you have almost certainly seen elsewhere and this is um, part of the table of contents to the photography album listing all of the different businesses and and thankfully the the photo album which was kept by his daughter Mim Warlock who's, who some of you might know um, was updated periodically so is, is houses moved is ownership changed and was actually gone back through and identified where the photos were taken so it's really a treasure um, kind of of the history of Carnage that, that is held by, by the Frank Museum. But if you're going to build an electric railway, you need that first part, you need electricity, right? And electricity, although it is natural, you can't just really harness lightning, um, you need to build a power plant. And George Washington Frank, in, in developing and wanting to give this capital, knew that he had to get power. And the most cost-effective and efficient way that he could get electricity was harnessing water. And so he built, again, you've almost all certainly seen it, the spillway that runs through the middle of campus. 
That is the remnants of the electric power plant that the Frank family built. And this is what it looked like in the early days. As you can imagine, what is now the Kearney Canal, what is Kearney Lake, cutting through the elevation on the north side of town. And so they begin to build the spillway. They build the Kearney Canal, okay? Because the other need is irrigation, right? And so there's, there's a multifaceted way in which this works, is that they dredge out Kearney Lake, make it deeper, able to retain more water. They build a power plant, and then they dig the Kearney Canal so that they can transport that water to actually power the cotton mill. Um, and Cotton Mill Lake, now the state recre recreation area, or the, sorry, the city um, park, is the retention pond for the cotton mill. So water would be there and then it would come down. Uh, but this is what the spillway looked like at the very beginning. And this is actually in winter. You can see um, quite a bit of snow build up, some ice. Okay. And this further, this, this need to develop the power plant. Again, George Washington Frank was very wealthy. But he wasn't going to put all his money into this. Um, he also needed public support and he needed support from the city. And so this is, again, a, a, an artifact from the GW Frank Museum. We have a number of letters from the Frank family. And this is actually from Augustus Frank, from, from George Washington Frank's brother, who, who'd been a congressman during the Civil War. And he's writing to M.A. Brown, who's the publisher of the Kearney Hub. And he's saying, you know, I noticed that the, the Hub is, is taking the gallant fight in making the, the investment in passing a bond issue to expand the Kearney Canal. If we have a bigger canal, we can have more water, we can have bigger engines, we can produce more electricity. We can also irrigate more acreage. Okay, this is very important for the development of the community. I cannot see why any citizen or taxpayer or in any wise in, interested in the city of Kearney and its future growth and prosperity could think for a moment of doing anything than other than voting to a large our canal. Appropriate for the day after election. <laughs> I look upon the canal as the key to the future prosperity of Kearney, giving the city as it would be the greatest water power in the state of Nebraska. So when you look at the Kearney Canal today, you're probably looking at it from the hike and bike trail. You just think of it, oh, it's really nice. It's a nice little waterway. But it actually is, is right. This is key to the prosperity of the city in this time period, the ability to have electric power. Nobody else has an electric power plant in any of the surrounding communities. We're able to bring industry in, we're able to bring the streetcars in, we're able to develop the city. Now, this is all gonna come crashing down, but for a time, we had this possibility. And so they do, this is, this is they're ultimately then able to, they do pass the bond issue, they do um, build um, a more substantial spillway, and this is, and, and you know, when you're driving home, you're driving down Highway 30 and you look over, just past the Health and Sports Center, this is still there, right? This is a central feature of our campus today. And to do that though, to actually use that water, then it's not just the spillway, it's also the power plant. And so for, for many years, and, and, and many of you who've been in Kearney for, for quite some time will remember this building in a slightly modified form, uh, standing for many years on the, the northern edge of campus there, north of the Health and Sports Center, right next to the spillway. Okay. And if you'll notice, peeking out, is an electric streetcar. Mm -hmm. So this is this is the power plant. This is the hydroelectric plant that actually is powering. It's also the streetcar barn, where the streetcars go every evening for repair and rest. Okay. And so um, this critical bit of infrastructure, which you know remained on campus but just very very briefly served um, as the electric trolley. Um, Garage, and I'll, we'll, we'll see a photo later, and you might remember. But this is this is a fire insurance map that kind of gives you a sense of of how this works. That there were two um, tunnels cut from Kearney Canal into the power plant, and then powering the turbines, and then all of the wastewater would would come down the spillway, um, providing we've got we've got a turbine with 300 horsepower and another double turbine with 856 horsepower. Very powerful electric plant. Okay. <laughs> Um, not even just barely breaking a thousand horsepower, um, but enough for the city of Kearney. Okay. Um, and Kearney Lake also um, is also where most of the people in, commu in the community are getting their ice for their um, uh, freezers at home. That during the winter they would cut up the lake and then store it year round. You could come and get ice at the ice house, which is now um, presumably there's a home here. But um, water. Water can cause problems. 
Um, and this this lovely photo actually gives us an inside view of what the inside of the powerhouse looked like. Um, and again, here's the here's the, the trolley entrance. Right here. Um, but yeah, but wiped out an enormous chunk of uh, the spillway, and and they they replaced the building, they replaced all this. Um, but I was I was talking with a colleague this morning. Um, that we can identify probably the least intelligent person in town at the time period because he's leaning out the window. <laughs> <laughs> and there is no supporting wall. <laughs> so that is a mildly dangerous position to be in. Um, but I think survive. Um, but, you know, there's there's multi-ton uh, uh, equipment just kind of like dangling in the air. So uh, slightly, slightly yeah. worrisome uh, position for, for whoever. But the streetcar line, once the Franks have, have provided the capital, they have built the power plant, okay, and they have the input of the city, they're then able to, they do lay, they lay five and a half miles of track um, going, going eastward, following much of the route for the original horse-drawn carriage, um, and then likely continuing further west, although there, there is still some debate among the, the few scholars of this issue about how far west the line goes because the records are a little scant. But this is this is Green Terrace, um, which again was the first dormitory on campus. It's all built, it's one building, even though it's designed to look like multiple buildings. Um, it was designed by the Frank family along with uh, the Frank family home. And so it, it has that kind of neo-Romanesque styling. Um, and, and you know, for for Carnegie State College students of a certain era, they they what they will remember about this building is the cockroaches. <laughs> um, or so I've been told. Um, but it briefly served as the Midway Hotel when the Midway Hotel burned down, and that's when this photo was taken. Um, <laughs> but here we get our first depiction of these new electric streetcars. Um, the Frank family very quickly after they get the capital, they take control of the horse railway. Um, get the investment from the city. They then send representatives from their company down to the American Car Company in St. Louis and purchase five electric streetcars and two trailers that, that can be tacked onto the back of the trolley um, for, for particular uh, high traffic uh, time periods. Um, and so this is, you know, a state-of-the-art bit of equipment for the era. And also identifying, as you can see here, the, the locations that it goes, it goes to East Lawn, okay, the eastern part of town, it goes down to the courthouse, the Midway Hotel, and then the West End. And so this photo, again, for those, those thinking about campus today, this is probably taken approximately where, where Copeland Hall is at, um, where the, the new um, clock tower is, the blue clock tower that's right there, um, kind of in the middle of the, the um, 26th Street corridor on campus. And it went out to the West End. Mm -hmm. And this is a part of Kearney that uh, few are familiar with. This is West Kearney. This is now a cornfield. This is the cornfield directly south of the Humane Society, behind Thursdays and behind Steinberg's. It's a cornfield. But in the 1890s, it was going to be the next great community along the Union Pacific. Uh, George Washington Frank uh, owned all of the land um, and developed and platted a modern city with, um, and there, there were a number of homes that were ultimately built out here, but then they were all moved um, into the Pioneer neighborhood um, when this didn't take off. But to attract developers, he built this incredibly well manicured and landscaped uh, lawn, but there was going to be this large park here in the middle, and you can see, I mean, an extensive crew. You've got somebody looking at it, you've got a fountain here in the middle, a whole crew of gardeners, okay, and then to give you a sense of where this is at, this structure here with the smokestack, that is the State Industrial Boys Home, what's now YRTC. So we're looking north um, from the railroad tracks. And it was going to be such an important part of the development of Kearney, it had its own train depot. This is the West Kearney train depot. Um, and if you can tell also the stylings of um, this, it looks like the Frank House. Very intentionally, it looks like the Frank House. Okay. Um, I don't know exactly, I do, I do have to share, I have something of a really bad eBay habit. Um, I bought this photo, it, uh, 
from someone in Canada. Um, of all places. Um, there's a Carney Canada. I thought it was Carney Canada. It is very much not. You can see it right here. Back end. But you've got a whole crew of gardeners out here working on this. You've got, you know, all sorts of plants, um, irrigation, everything. This was going to be the next great development on the prairies. This was going to be the, the, the St. Paul to the Minneapolis of Kearney. Um, and, and this is where, where purportedly the trolley went out this far west. Again, it's difficult to kind of ascertain based on, on maps and newspaper accounts about whether they actually got this far. But, but the intent was, at the very least, to get this far west to the, the, the you know, present-day location of Lake Steinberg. But it wasn't without issues. As, as Dr. Vanning noted, I, I study hobos for a living. And so uh, that's what this is. This is a complaint before the city council in 1894 because kids are hopping on the streetcars for free. Um, and understandably, they're complaining to the city council because the children are stealing rides, um, which is also very dangerous, as you can imagine, um, hopping on one of these things. Yeah, a complaint was made that a number of boys are in the habit of jumping on streetcars for the purpose of stealing rides. The police were instructed to arrest all such boys when found annoying the streetcar people. <laughs> annoying the streetcar people. Uh, also identifying particular people as streetcar people. Um, the other thing also, and I did just to include this also to go tangential, um, just, just a little bit of current history. The authority of the police to take dogs for the non-payment of tax has been questioned by many. <laughs> the council ordered the police to take all such dogs and to follow out the ordinance in that respect strictly. So just a reminder, I don't know if this is still on the books. If you don't pay your taxes, they're going to take your dog. <laughs> Early Carney's weird. <laughs> but with that development, and also the dog taking law, um, this is the Carney of the 1890s. This is the streetcar era. You have the Opera House now constructed, the current site of, of uh, Bruce Furniture. Okay, here's the low building as well. And then you can faintly see in the background, there's, there's the radio station. Um, and you've got a line of streetcars, as we're going to see. This is this is a cold winter day in Kearney, 1884, 1885. Um, you can actually see the snow is in the street in the open gutters. Okay, the the engineer is wearing a thick coat, and then you've got actually got streetcars lined up. There's one here, there's one here, and then there's one turning off 25th Street, all the way up north. And so it's really easy for folks to get around. It's a nickel to ride this thing, and you can go all across town. You don't have to step in the muck. It's enclosed, so you can you can get out of the the worst of the weather. Okay, but it's not without its problems. You can all go all the way to the courthouse. So if you need to, you don't have a driver's license in this time period, but if you needed to go to the courthouse, and this is again present day location of the courthouse. The current courthouse was actually built around this building, so the parking lot on the north side of the building. Um, where, where this statue still is um, from the face of the building um, is this location. And also, if just if anybody can tell me where this statue went, because it has kind of disappeared off the face of Kearney. I, I assume it got scrapped in a war, but um, I would really like somebody to tell me where Lady Justice went. But again, you can see they're promoting, again, these, these, these photos are promotional images that are taken by the Anderson, or by A.T. Anderson, for Eastern investors. Okay. So by demonstrating both that we had a courthouse, we've got a rigid justice system. We're not like those other frontier counties that don't have a courthouse yet. Okay. We have a courthouse. We have a modern courthouse. And we have an electric trolley that you can take to the courthouse. So when you have to go to pay your property taxes when you open a very large factory, it's going to be really, really easy to do that. Um, but again, things get, things get difficult. In 1893, there's a massive depression in the United States. The economy collapses um, and until the Great Depression. That was the Great Depression. It was the Depression of 1893. And the Franks lose incredible amounts of money. This is the boom time that Carney has. This is the collapse. Uh, the industries that the Franks have, have provided capital for and attracted um, Eastern investors to collapse. The cotton mill shuts down. The cracker factory shuts down. The bicycle factory moves to Denver. 
the, the pickle factory shuts down. We have all sorts of industries. Uh, the oatmeal factory shuts down. The paper factory shuts down. One of the brickyards shuts down. And you notice the shift that happens in accounts of the trolley from the newspaper from this time period, where they say in 1895, from going forward, uh, you now have, there's no longer going to be a conductor. You now have to deposit your nickels in a box. They can only afford to pay one person, the engineer. There's no longer two people on every trip. And this decline, though, is also a period where you see sparks of inspiration that are coming from the trolley. And this is, again, where, where historians like to go on tangents. This is Phineas Barney, a member of, of the Barney family, um, which is still in town today. Um, and he was an inventor. He was a jeweler, um, grew up in Kearney, spent time in Kearney, came with the rest of the family to Kearney, actually is, is, is buried in Elm Creek. But, but for the purpose of today's talk, we're going to talk about him as a Carniite. Sorry, anybody from Elm Creek, I know there's a couple of you. Um, but he patented a new clutch for a streetcar in 1892. When we had the streetcars here in town. So it's unclear whether he was inspired by or working for, he was a jeweler by trade, so I don't actually know if he was, was working um, for the trolleys or assisting to fix the trolleys, but you can see the the possibility of, of riding the cars in Carney and being like, this, the, the gears are shifting too slowly, I need to invent a whole new clutch, um, which then was, was patented. And, there's the signature. Um, and it's, it's much better than his other inventions, um, which was a cross-shaped butter churn <laughs> and a new form of uh, photography viewfinder. Okay, this, this is 1885, this is 1921, so he's got 40 years of successful patents um, to his name. Um, I don't know if there's any, yeah, if any of these things still survive or if we actually ever made them. Um, but again, it's this spirit of modernity, this possibility for something new, for, for the ability of technology that, that the streetcar is bringing to the city, that you can actually see it reflected in the hobbies and the scientific interests of people in the community. Um, but again, things are on the decline by the 1850s or the late 1890s. Um, so the hub blasts, which had long been a supporter, M.A. Brown, the um, editor and publisher of the hub in this time period, big supporter of the Frank family, had long been one of their champions, while the rest of the papers in town were, were really critical of the Franks, uh, writes this editorial that all that the city wants is electric lights, electric streetcar service, and above all, above all, electric power. It does not want violated contracts, defunct franchise, or the false hope of completed water power. It's simply a question of sink or swim. So we've come a long way in, in only just a brief couple of years from the poem published in the Carney Hub about how, uh, you know, the, the, the on the make, on the fly are the streetcar lines to now it's sink or swim. And it does sink. The streetcar line does not work. The Franks lose their money. It goes bankrupt in 1895. Most of the tracks are then pulled up and the cars, as we'll talk about, disappear. And the Franks leave. They sell their home, um, and the Franks then disappear from Kearney. They leave Kearney, except for Pauline Frank, uh, the daughter-in-law of um, George Washington Frank, who becomes the first librarian at the Public Library. And the loss of the streetcars is something that repeatedly kind of comes up as something that maybe we shouldn't have let happen. Um, so in 1915, there's a proposal for a bus service here in Carney, for a jitney bus. This is what, what a jitney bus looks like. Um, that we haven't, we've had no streetcar service or no regular defined method of transportation, and no efforts have been made to establish a service of this nature here since the boom days. This is 20 years later. The streetcars have been gone for 20 years, and there's still enough community memory of, yeah, we had public transportation. I could go downtown, I could go to the courthouse for a nickel. Why haven't we had that? Let's have a bus. They don't get the bus. They don't, they don't get the Jimmy bus service. But the streetcars will still come up. They'll still stay in the community memory here in Kearney. So as I said, this is the powerhouse. As many of you might remember it, when it was on campus, the, the, the roof had been removed, the, the, the points had been taken off the tower. Most times it seemed like there was a tree growing through the roof. Um, 
and the bay for the, the streetcar has been replaced by a garage. And it would still, I know that there's some of you who certainly will remember when there used to actually still be streetcar rail in the streets, um, but it would occasionally pop up. This is one of the uh, gentlemen from facilities at Kearney State College who found one of the switches um, when they were doing construction at 26 and 11. Um, and you can see it's six feet in length and weighs 200 pounds. So imagine pulling that out of the ground. Or you can just go look at 26th Street. So this is a shot of 26th Street from the dormitories on campus, the, the, the bridgeway that connects the Nestor Halls. 26th Street on this side of town is wider than all the other city streets because the streetcar line used to run down it. And you can still kind of see with the elevation that it still is slightly elevated from the roadway down the middle of the street. Okay, so this is the most visible kind of remnant now that the powerhouse is gone um, of the streetcar system still within the community because everything, this, this street was platted around the streetcar line. So even though the streetcar is gone, the street's still too wide. Or, which which is really nice because I don't know I, I know there's some students here but students can't drive that well um, <laughs> so it's really nice um, that they get a little extra space next to campus. Now there are also other things from the trial that survives, and I, I want to thank the Buffalo County Historical Society for generously letting me bring this in. Um, there's actually a piece of the trolley still in town. It's sitting on the table right up here. Um, and so this is a mirror from the interior of the trolley. Unclear which one, whether it was one, two, three, four, or five, um, doesn't really matter which one it was, but the fact that it survived. And there's a message on the back. This mirror, out of old Kearney Streetcar, 1891, given to nursery by Harry Lambert, Kearney, Nebraska. And I have spent far too long looking at old catalogs for the American Car Company to actually figure out where this went. It's the mirror that goes above the door. This is a little more, this is the, the, the luxury model. This is not the one that the city of Carney paid for. Um, this is not what the inside looked like, but, but does give you a sense of, you know, what riding in one of these cars would have been like. You've got electric power, right? You've got light bulbs in the cars. Um, it's, you're, you're protected from the elements. You are, you're not riding on a horse. Okay, you're not stepping in the street and the muck. What this meant for investors, for community members, was that the modern world was in the streets of Carney for a decade, um, for a very, very short period of time. But again, as you know, this legacy of the streetcars has continued and persisted. So those of you who were in Kearney in 1998 will remember when the streetcars came back, okay, which was also a very intentional effort that this is something that needed to be done because we'd had streetcars before. And so with that, um, I also have a chunk, again, some of you, some of you may have these, um, but a, a chunk of the streetcar rail as well um, that has, over the years they've been found in the street and things. Um, but if anybody has other pieces of the trolley or maybe a whole trolley car in your barn or garage, <laughs> could you please let us know? We would really like to find it because the long-standing rumor is um, is that, that there's a 50-year-old memory um, from someone who used to ride on the streetcars that said, I remember seeing them in Boulder and they still said Kearney on them. There's also a community rumor that they were dumped into Kearney Lake. One or the other. <laughs> um, either way, my, my hunch is that they, they, were, they, were, they were sold to parts. But I want to thank again the public library and then all of the institutions that provided the resources for this talk. And now questions. So keep that hand up first. Yes. I've not seen any, I've not specifically looked for that though. This is just a cell phone photo I took yesterday, um, which is why it's a little, well, it looks like today, it's great. Um, but no, I will I, I will look for that. I'm sure certainly in the university archive possibly, um, or, or yet at BCHS there would be photos of the fully landscaped street. 
Um, Edison DC and Tesla AC was their conversion. Edison. Uh, the, the Edison um, company is the one who put in, it was uh, Westinghouse and Edison who put the engines into the um, power plant. Never converted? Uh, as far as I know, I, don't, I, I do not know. Um, it is beyond my understanding. Um, there's a lot of correspondence from the Franks when they're communicating with Westinghouse to get slightly more powerful, um, but I believe it's DC power for the most part, which I think kind of also limited the range and the ability for, for what they wanted to do. How did the street cars cross the UP tracks? Good question. I don't know. There's only photos of them right in front of the railroad tracks. I, I believe that they did have a, like a, a, a diamond crossing um, that would have gone across the tracks. But there are accounts of like when the power would go out and the street cars would be stopped on the tracks. Um, and that they then have to push them so that they didn't get hit by the train. Um, so I believe that they had, they had, a, they had a crossing there uh, that would have facilitated their movement. Further south. I guess I always assumed that Frank brought the power plant to Carnegie, mm -hmm. but there was power before he got mm -hmm. here. Where was that? Um, much what smaller, much smaller, uh, like coal and um, kind of more, much more rudimentary forms of electric power. Um, there were there were small coal burning power plants because also, and, and the Franks knew this when they designed the facility. Um, the, the Carney Canal froze over in the winter, and so the hydropower wouldn't work. Um, and so they did have other power plants that provided much smaller amounts of electricity, um, which was always part of the complaint is the inconsistency of electric power in this era, just because of um, the, the, the early technology and then whether it was coming out of the plant, whether there was water, if it was a drought, things like that, or whether it was coming from one of the coal burning facilities that were also around town. Are any of them still standing? Uh, as far as I know, no. No, no. Uh, when and why did Second Avenue become kind of the main street instead of? The overpass. Oh. Um, Central Avenue, which was originally Wyoming Avenue, um, and then facilitation is, is, is the interstate comes online in the late 1950s, early 1960s. Um, and businesses kind of moved to that direction as well as further north. Um, the construction of the mall, the construction of um, USA, which, which at one point was a Safeway, um, the need for that becoming the business corridor rather than um, Central Avenue. Was the canal in full of water year round or was it seasonal? And if it was seasonal, did that affect the supply of electricity? Yeah, because they were using it for irrigation. Um, and so that's why they part of this entire effort was they, they dredged out Kearney Lake so that they could retain um, more water to kind of um, offset any of those things. But, but drought issues, irrigation, um, any sort of weather things certainly affected the power. And again, that's why they're complaining all the time that, you know, the power goes out and they've got to push the trolleys or nobody has electricity or the factories. It's just, it, and a lot of the correspondence and survives with the Franks is, is they initially, you know, build the power plant. The, the engines that they build are, are not big enough to take the power loads that the, the, the demand that the city has. Um, and they're never able to kind of just get it right um, to, to offset all of those problems. Um, but it's still enough of a, a Provided that MPPD has a modern facility there now, just off off of um, the football stadium, right? When did Good Sam block off the end of Central Avenue? Uh, Good Sam comes in the 1920s, um, 1925, 26. Don't quote me on that. Now the first uh, first dormitory was still being used in 1953. Did you find any reference to what the students call it? Uh, I've heard it called the Roche Motel. What did you call it? It was called Cockroach Castle. Cockroach Castle. Yep, yep. It was not a very nice building because it was built in the 1880s, mind you. So it's already seven years old. 70 years old by 1950. 
Um, and I think a lot of deferred maintenance. Yeah, then the Congress went to Case Hall. They bulldozed Case Hall, now they're in Coach Flint. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're seeing to buy from that power plant into the levels where you is at right now to heat up at all? Uh, no, the the um, I believe there's a different facility, um, and ultimately they build a, a steam power plant um, north of the tuberculosis hospital, provides most of that, um, which um, is the water plant that's still there north of communications. Uh, the 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 boiler plant. Yeah, the boiler plant is still there. It's just north of the communication. The, the old nurses' quarters is right there, um, between the canal and the road. And then there was a steam plant on the east coast. Yeah. Well, thank you. Oh, oh. I just can I ask you. Um, could Sam have its own little power system that one of their engineers very well could just Sam? Um, that I'm not um, familiar with, but probably just because of the demands, the, the unique demands of that type of institution, just to make sure that you always are constantly having supply. It wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me like they have generators today. Um, it would not surprise me. But um, yeah, so if, if you want to see um, the, the chunk of the trolley, um, and I'm more than happy to turn it over if you want to read what's on the back. Um, but otherwise, again, thank you all for coming out. Um, it's been a wonderful, wonderful way to spend my own Thank you.